Um, thank you everyone for coming to this Open Access Books Network session on open access usage data, present knowledge and future developments. My name is Lucy Barnes and uh, I work at Open Book Publishers, which is a non-profit academic led open access press based in the UK. And I'm also a coordinator of the Open Access Books Network, which is hosting this session today. The Open Access Books Network is an open network for anyone who's interested in open access books to ask questions, share information and knowledge about OA books, to engage in discussions, um, to participate in events as you're all doing today, and to find helpful resources via the network. And we're delighted to welcome today Christina Drummond, Executive Director of the OA eBook Usage Data Trust, and Lucy Montgomery, who's Professor of Knowledge Innovation at Curtin University and co-lead of the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative. And they're here today to talk about the OA eBook Usage Data Trust pilot project, which ran from 2020 to 2022, and particularly the new developments that their work on OA book usage data is going to take over the coming years, um, building on and drawing from that project. Um, for those of you who's, who've been to one of our sessions before, you'll know we try to leave plenty of time for audience questions, um, so I hope you'll have plenty. Um, so Christina, I think, is going to speak first for 10 minutes, and then Lucy is going to follow on for 10 minutes. Um, and then I've got a few questions that I would like to ask, uh, and we'll then open the floor um, to everybody. If you've got a question at any time, please drop it into the chat and I can pick it up um, and ask it. Or if you, when we open the floor, if you'd like to ask your question um, in person, then you can uh, turn your camera on and un unmute your mic uh, and ask the question that way. So without further ado, I will hand over to Christina. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Lucy, and thanks to all of you at the Open Access Books Network for being here today and for your interest in solving a lot of these issues we have around OA book usage data. Um, so uh, as you know, I'm the executive director for this OA book usage data trust effort and in the last grant, I was a project uh, program officer. So you've probably heard me go through some of these today, but I thought it would be useful to start with a little description of the journey we've been on. Um, I should start at kind of this pivotal point where we ended in our last grant, which is really defining that the mission we're focused on together is this exchange of reliable usage data and finding a way to do that in a trusted, equitable, and community-governed way. Um, we also really came together as a community to recognize that the principles of open scholarly infrastructure are very relevant to what we're doing and that we want to adopt that in this work here. And so as you see on your screen, we work towards those principles in the work that we're doing here going forward. Um, we also have a number of places online where you can follow our work, both in the web and in Zenodo, where we put all of our project outputs. Um, and Twitter, for those of you who haven't had a chance to follow us, which I know is complicated these days, but we'll come back to that later. So with that, I wanted to start to talk about the journey that Lucy and I got to be on together. And goodness, I even came in three years ago. So Lucy uh, and many others started this conversation at Sally Communications Institute back in 2015 with many of you, I think, on this call. And that conversation really focused on all of these issues around usage data reporting and how to get all of the different types of usage data reports out of dashboards, out of emails, and pull it together, um, even in this world where we have standards like counter. That work led to support from the Mellon Foundation to bring together individuals in a workshop to explore those issues in more detail, but also to explore the data trust concept. Can we work together as a community to resolve some of these issues? That initial grant uh, in 2018, 2019 led us to another round of funding from the Mellon Foundation to actually go in and look at some of the specific use cases. How are people looking to apply this OA usage data? Um, and what does that supply chain look like? How does the usage data flow in our scholarly communications ecosystem so that we know where it is? And in the meantime, uh, we also got to work with four university presses, as well as a Wapen and Spring of Nature to understand how um, that data could be pulled together and visualized in dashboards, which really is the precursor for the book analytics dashboard project that you'll hear later today. And all of that said, we had to think about what does it mean to be community governed? And that's where we got to our mission and principles that you saw a moment ago. That work, um, I do wanna highlight here, the data trust model that came out of that really focused us on this possibility for us to come together as a community of diverse stakeholders to explore how we might, uh, I, I call it creating the, recreating the wheel every time. How can we get economies of scale and work together as a network 
to more easily exchange um, our usage data in what I would call global data clearinghouse, which is very different than an open data commons because we recognize that usage data is personally identifiable when it's the full IP address. It can involve other unique identifiers like those for scholars. Um, but more importantly, a lot of that usage data is also uh, for some proprietary or sensitive, um, and it speaks to their operations. So it's not something that could just be made freely open. So this data trust model really is one that was dependent on trust and reciprocity and community where there has to be mutual benefit across diverse sets of stakeholders. And so with that, you know, some have seen this, we have a very diverse set of stakeholders in our last grant who came together to explore these issues. Um, and I was really lucky to work as a program officer alongside Lucy and six uh, PIs, two dozen project advisors and over a hundred uh, stakeholders who are participated in our community consultations to do this work. Um, those consultations took a lot of different forms alongside our research. We had interviews, we had a number of online workshops, um, and because this was all during the pandemic, in addition to technical research development that Lucy will speak to in a moment that resulted in these dashboard proofs of concept. And just to flag for all of, on this call, some of the key research findings um, really were those stakeholder uh, reports. What are the exact questions people are trying to answer with OA usage data? And what are the ways in which they want to look to use this OA book usage data beyond just reporting? And I think that is the key here because everyone starts with we need author reporting, we need funder reporting. But what surfaced in our research was that there was an interest in taking the uh, usage data uh, if we can get it in a quality and interoperable way that can plug into internal systems. They want to apply this for internal operational analytics and strategic decision making. And that was everything from editorial strategy, how can you take things and maybe translate them into print editions of certain parts of the world based on the usage you're seeing, to evaluating promotional campaigns, um, and other places people are looking at to inform collections development. So many different operational use cases as well. Another report I quickly want to flag is this one here about open access book supply chain. I talked about the data flows, the many metadata standards and technical standards here. And Michael Cluck and Laura Ritchie did an exceptional job compiling all of that into this report that you see on your screen. And the thing that I want to flag as I was noting um, you know, everyone's pulling together usage data. And in this picture where you see multiple arrows coming together, each publisher, each library, the library management systems, they have to collate, normalize, figure out how to bring together the usage data to tell the story of a single book or to tell the story for a single author or to tell a story for a single grant. And that work is complicated technically. That takes a lot of time. And in an ongoing fashion, if you want to do that in, as a trend, here's what that story looks like over the long tail of book usage, it becomes ever more complicated. This is the problem that we're trying to resolve by working together. Um, Lucy will go into more detail, but the dashboard pilots were exceptional. They actually resulted in working prototypes and uh, turned into the Book Analytics dashboard project. So I won't go into more work here, but this is an exceptional amount of work that really allowed us to understand from a technical perspective what is involved in pulling data from different parties so that you have that cross-platform sharing of information that can then be visualized and used uh, in creative ways. So with that, I'm going to transition for a moment and talk about our future, because our projects, um, at the end of the last project, and I apologize, I think I moved the slide here, um, our projects at the end of, goodness, or last year, knew coming from a legal analysis that the European Data, uh, data Act, the Data Governance Act in particular, is is setting forth a path where those who are acting as data mediaries, those who are exchanging data between parties, um, they, it sets rules for the road for organizations that want to do that because they recognize the importance of trust and neutrality. And in that European Data Governance Act, um, which sits alongside the Data Marketplaces Act as part of the overall European data strategy, um, the, the DGA, it specifies that for those who want to help to exchange data, you can't provide a service on top of that. You can't generate revenue from, say, a dashboard or an analytics service 
if you're also the one who's working to exchange data in a trusted way and process that data according to community rules underneath. And so for us, that really flagged this point where we knew we had to separate the project into two. And so uh, the data trust part really is focusing on this concept of trust. Uh, the importance of fostering a network of trust among the many individuals and organizations who create and rely on OA usage data around the world. Uh, when I talk about trust, you know, that means trust in data security for the data sharing, trust in the fairness of the usage data processing algorithms uh, for aggregation or privacy masking or benchmarking. And most importantly, something that you see repeatedly noted by organizations like the Open Data Institute is that for any type of data collaborative, there has to be trust by all involved that automation and linked data at scale will do no harm. No harm to readers, no harm to authors, and no harm to the organizations that provide or rely on that data that was exchanged. So as the world's learning this week with Twitter, we're reminded that we have to be careful when we think about what organization is in charge of that trust and transfer. And so this is why we're looking at how do we develop trusted infrastructure in our community to support that neutral data exchange. Um, and I think of it, you know, my dream is to get to a point where it's like the internet. We don't think about how the internet supports the transfer of all of our communications worldwide. Can we get to a point like that for usage data, for OA book usage data, where we don't think about how it comes together, but we're able to use it. So lots of different entities create and consume that data that we're talking about kind of integrating and playing between. They range across that ecosystem. And the key to us thinking about this is leveraging something else that's been funded very heavily by the European Union through Gaia-X. It's this international data space concept for what I would call a shared data intermediation. Uh, last week at the Charleston Library Conference, you know, a lot of organizations are talking about their innovative services they're building, but everyone is recreating that clearinghouse and exchange function, the bottom of the technical stack within Open Scholarly infrastructure. And I keep sitting here wondering how many of these do we need to support as an overall community? Um, and so you're gonna hear about the work that we've learned, you know, where work that's been done in the book analytics dashboard project, um, but from OA Switchboard to OAble to Chorus, there are so many others who are also trying to pull this together. So the question we have is, can we do this instead as an ecosystem? Um, and so, you know, through a trusted community-wide data intermediary that supports lots of efforts in a trusted neutral way. Just to give folks a sense of this model, if you take that stack and I like to spin it, I'm a very visual person, so apologies. Um, this is a framework called the International Data Spaces. If you Google it, there's actually an association of growing data spaces. Um, and so the nice thing is that in this European data strategy, this international data spaces framework exists, has created standards, certification standards with significant funding through Horizon Europe and Gaia-X. And data spaces are already up and running to foster data exchange among industry stakeholders in logistics and transportation and telecommunications. And now, thanks to the Mellon Foundation, our usage data trust effort is looking to apply this model to OA book usage, slice of book publishing, um, starting with the governance building blocks so that we can apply our community governance and principles to what this would look like. What does that mean? Oh goodness, I'm going over a bit. Is that okay? I'm gonna look at Lucy. Okay, good. So um, in this world of OA book usage, you know, at the most basic, we're trying to identify those data creators who's creating the usage data and who wants to use it so that we can pilot this IDS model to understand how we create automations and trust at scale. And a big piece of this is having a common set of rules, which we call our data rule book, um, which then inform those legal agreements and the transparent processing algorithms that sets the technical requirements for the system at large. So Mellon gave us uh, 1.2 million US to spend the next three years focusing on a lot of the aspects around the governance building blocks for such a system. So how do we ensure that we have all of our stakeholders at the table and we can maintain both neutrality and trust through our decision-making around this infrastructure? Um, we also need to create that data exchange and stewardship rulebook, which is key to what we want to accomplish in that exchange. Um, yet, sustainability of open infrastructure is perhaps 
uh, the third leg of the stool and the most important. So we need to understand for those who are participating in shared infrastructure, what is the return on investment? And that will, of course, influence what sustainability for such shared infrastructure would look like over time. Um, I am incredibly lucky to be part of this larger group that includes open air um, and the many things that they've been creating to do similar things with an EOSC. Um, so Paulo Mangi, their CTO, has been working alongside us, as well as Yannick Laguerre, who is the Secretary General over at OPRAS. Um, so we're incredibly lucky to be working with these partners to look at how we can leverage these existing infrastructures for the work we're trying to do with OA book usage. And as you see here, we have an incredible array of both trustees who are looking at the strategic level for our effort, as well as project advisors um, through our project advisory board to help inform our process forward. So with that, I'll note, uh, we can go into more details later, but for any usage uh, data creators, if you're interested in helping us to pilot the IDS, uh, please reach out by email. I'll go ahead and stop there. Thank you, Lucy. Thanks very much, Christina. That was great. Uh, and a huge amount to try and explain and talk through. So I say you were challenged with that time. Um, so next, Lucy, would you like to go, go next? Okay, I'm just going to hopefully share my screen. Um, is that working? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Christina, and thank you for the invitation to, um, yeah, to talk about this project. Uh, watching Christina, I'm really struck, first of all, for me, by how much I really genuinely love this project. Uh, I think, you know, Christina's just really highlighted the extent to which we are grappling with really big and timely and important questions about how we handle data as communities, what rules we want around how we share and use data, uh, and what good governance in our spaces can look like. Um, but this project has also always been one that's been incredibly pragmatic. And for me, my pathway into this project was working uh, in the open access book space and having that moment of realisation that big commercial players were moving into uh, data related services in a big way um, and a really strong sense for me that actually the things I value as a, um, a professor operating in a faculty of humanities, uh, as a researcher, as someone in the academic system, I really care about uh, the books that are being published, the communities that are publishing those books, and whether or not we've got diversity in the voices that are participating in conversations uh, and diversity in the opportunities that we have in terms of how we share knowledge. Um, so for me, this, this question of, okay, well, what are we doing around usage data? Are we just going to kind of sit and uh, wait for big players with a lot of resources and the ability to come in and really, you know, kind of provide flashy services to tell us what this landscape is going to look like, or do we need to start jumping in now um, and really learning how we might uh, shape a landscape that we want and how we might think about working together uh, to create services that we're going to need if we want to support continued diversity. So that was how I sort of came to the original uh, project and back in 2015 when we started talking about a data trust. And over time, that's evolved to, for me, um, now mean that I'm leading uh, this second project, which is the twin project that came out of our previous Mellon grant, uh, the Book Analytics Dashboard Demonstration Project. Uh, and we have funding from 2022 to 2025 uh, to I hope, uh, deliver a sustainable and scalable and practical service focused on usage analytics for open access books that can support diverse communities. Um, I'm based at Curtin University, and one of the reasons a lot of the really incredible technical work that 
I've kind of had the privilege of being involved in has been possible has been because we've been able to work with the Curtin Institute for Computation. So Curtin University is a very science and engineering heavy university. We have some fantastic data science um, and we are able to access really great high quality data scientists who we can pull over into our humanities focused and humanities led projects and I think that's really changed the shape of what we've been able to do and the questions we've been able to ask with these projects. Um, in this second project we're also really fortunate because we have partnered with OAPEN um, which has got a long history in the open access book infrastructure space and it has a lot of experience that I think um, certainly as a researcher in a university, um, I don't have about how sustainable um, infrastructures can operate, what the practical challenges um, associated with delivering a service to a big and diverse community kind of involve. And I'm really hopeful that, you know, with this team of partners, we're going to be able to do something really interesting. Um, let me see. Okay, right. So Christina just uh, gave a really fantastic um, sort of presentation that was sort of explaining the deep origins of the Away Ibu project, which started, it kind of started in 2015 as this concept that came out of an SCI Institute um, summer school event. And then eventually in 2020 and 2022, we got a uh, 1.2 million, I think, US dollar grant, a big grant from Mellon. Um, and we were able to begin a pilot of the Data Trust. And when we got to the end of that grant, uh, we were given an opportunity to really think about whether we needed to move that project forward as a single project or whether actually what we were trying to do was more than one thing. There were the governance questions, the data transfer questions, the protocols and and all of that sort of work, those conversations that need to happen, the things Christina's discussed. But then also we have what's potentially pretty soon a viable dashboard service um, that we can start rolling out to uh, publishers, I think, in the next you know, couple of years. So the question for us about whether or not we should decouple those two functions, uh, which was put to us by Mellon, I think was a really important question. Uh, and we did decide that instead of going forward as a single mega project, we would split and become two sister projects in this current um, round of work that we're doing. Um, so the 2020 to 22 pilot project, when we were just one big data trust project, was an opportunity for us to explore the technical possibilities and the needs of people engaging with usage data. And we were able to do that in a really, um, you know, deep dive, interesting, pragmatic way using, uh, you know, real dashboards that we could model for partners and, you know, having a lot of really intense conversations about what different partners wanted to use dashboards for, where their data was coming from, how we would handle it, what we would need to do. Um, and that has taken us a certain, a certain distance, but we've now got uh, the challenge in my project of taking what we learned in the previous project um, and turning it into a transparent, trusted and community controlled analytic service that can support open access books. So our next, what we're doing now currently and until 2025 is focusing on scaling dashboard infrastructures and workflows that we developed in the previous pilot developing a practical service, figuring out how we provide customer support, what onboarding at scale can look like. Um, and then really importantly, I think, um, exploring and implementing long-term plans for housing maintenance and funding. Um, and yeah, there are a whole bunch of quite important differences, I think, between the work that we did in the previous pilot uh, previously, our technical work uh, and the, the work that my project team was really doing was focused on working with a, a small number of partners to explore 
how the usage data that was available to them could be made useful. So we were working with uh, a deliberately diverse group of publishers to find out where they were already getting usage data from, how they were using that data, uh, how they wanted to be able to use that data. And then we were also assessing data sources uh, to work through whether or not the data sources that publishers were telling us they wanted were going to be suitable for integration into some kind of scalable community infrastructure. Um, and, you know, so for example, if we need to set up a service, it needs to be um, you know, viable. We we haven't got 10,000 people who can sit doing lots of manual fiddling with systems. How hard is it going to be for us to pull data from JSTOR or from Google Analytics into a single nice dashboard for publishers? So it was lots of deep practical work exploring those questions. Um, and we also did a lot of work because we have a great data science group are really interested in uh, good practice when it comes to displaying uh, data and uh, making sure that information is conveyed. Uh, so there was a lot of, you know, looking at structures and which filters were going to be useful, uh, what functionality we needed to be able to provide, all of these quite technical things. And we did produce some quite impressive, I think, prototype dashboards. But uh, they weren't slick and shiny and super responsive and easy to embed in websites and optimized for mobile phones because during the pilot we weren't focused on those things. We were focused on, um, you know, on the the other kind of less um, easy to sell, easy to scale commercial aspects of what we were doing to try and make sure we had best practice all the way through. Um, so. Just super quickly, because I know we're going to run out of time for questions. Uh, we put a lot of effort into making sure that we understood what best practice in data handling and data hygiene uh, should look like or could look like in relation to usage data for open access books. Uh, and you can see uh, there, there will be some links to the prototype dashboards from the last pilot um, at the end of this presentation. But um, for example, the dashboard design we settled on was very careful about keeping data from different sources that had been handled and cleaned and provided in different ways separate uh, and making information about data provenance and processing visible uh, so that we weren't just encouraging uh, people using these dashboards to uh, look for the biggest number and to uh, ignore questions about where that data had come from or whether or not they were trying to compare apples with bananas. Um, the other uh, sort of work that we really put a bit of thought into with the previous dashboard related to um, making sure that we were being really clear about when data had been fetched. So did we have a data set that had been refreshed yesterday or was it a data set that was maybe you know last updated in 2010 and for anyone who's really trying to use data to understand patterns uh, in usage or make decisions based on that data those kinds of details begin to make a lot of difference because it really changes the shape and the trends of things that you can see with the data um, the other thing um, that we really spent a lot of time thinking about was this question of open um, and open practice and the idea that open source code really isn't enough uh, in our view. Um, we were really pushing towards a code base that other people or other platforms or groups would genuinely be able to re-implement um, build on and contribute to and uh, actually good quality uh, documentation and user guides and information uh, that goes with the code took in many cases almost as much time as the code to produce and create. Um, but I still, I have no regrets. I think it was really important and I'm really proud of the documentation that our team uh, produced. 
Um, so we've now moved on and I'm going to go just another two minutes to our next iteration with this bad um, project um, of dashboard design and moving from that really quite individualized bespoke uh, dashboard model where we were um, you know, working with individual partners saying, what do you want? And now we're moving towards something which I think needs to move towards being a single product that has got some kind of consensus around what's displayed and some kind of standardization around how those things are presented. Um, we've also been advised that apparently it turns out that although we really love all of the really geeky uh, but not very beautiful bits of our dashboards, uh, there may be, um, you know, communities that want to use these for marketing um, and promotion and for, you know, for purposes where actually audiences are not going to be focusing on the number of validated ISBNs uh, as their, you know, top priority. They're going to be interested in information that's well presented and clearly presented that they can understand quickly and without having to dig deeply into the dashboard and that involves some thoughtful design decisions and really thinking about how we can uh, reduce complexity and improve visual impact without kind of selling out uh, in terms of the things we think are important. Um, so for now, we are focusing, we've focused on a reasonably narrow set of use cases. We're thinking about a semi-standard product for small to medium presses that are publishing open access books, as well as uh, research funders. Um, we will be exploring additional use cases later in the project, but not in our first year. Um, and we're working with technical workflows that have been designed around Onyx and with um, definitely books in mind. We're not just trying to adapt ISBN and journal related systems to our workflows. So our technical workflows are assuming that our partners can provide us with an Onyx feed um, and that we can plug that into our pipelines and give them a dashboard that shows them uh, the things that are interesting and important about the books that they're sharing with us via Onyx. Um, and we are aware that that's not always easy for every publisher in a diverse landscape. So we're also currently thinking about um, how we can help to lower barriers for diverse partners when it comes to metadata and participation. Um, for example, potentially with collaborations with groups like Tote. Um, so we're in year one, we're in working currently on version 0.1 of our dashboard. These slides are going to be shared after this talk. So you'll be able to see what we're doing in each year of our project. But the, the red arrows uh, in between each of these project years are really highlighting the fact that we um, are heading out in between each version of the dashboard that we're producing and each iteration that we do in this project and engaging with users where, um, you know, trying to make sure that we have mechanisms that allow for community feedback on the technical work that we're doing. Um, and so there will be a process of community consultation and then technical road mapping and then implementation between each stage of the project. Uh, there are lots of links. We have all of our stuff up in Zenodo. We have beautiful technical documentation. We would love it if you uh, and admired it with us. <laughs> um, and you can see uh, some working prototypes of the dashboards. Finally, the only other thing um, I just wanted to very quickly show you is that we currently, ready for our first round of um, partner feedback, have a working um, current prototype of the new dashboard. Um, and I think it's actually I think it's pretty good. I like it, I, but I apparently am easily impressed. Um, and I think our team are doing, yeah, an interesting job of thinking through, for example, how do we make sure that all of the transparency, the, um, the data provenance, the good data practice that we identified in the last project is being pulled through into dashboards that are providing the things that we're, we're hearing from partners that they really want when it comes to a marketing 
style dashboard. So this dashboard is using data from uh, the University of Michigan Press, um, which they have given us permission to um, to share and to use for these dummy dashboards. At some point, this is going to be um, shared with communities as part of a consultation process so that we have something uh, concrete that we can um, get feedback on from user communities who are actually playing with something that's live. Um, so I think that's it <laughs> and I'll stop. Thanks, Lucy. That was great. Really, really interesting. Loads and loads of stuff to dive into. Um, I did have a list of questions before we started, and now I have even more. So uh, to start with, I suppose the thing that I hadn't necessarily thought of in advance, and maybe I should have, um, but came up in both of your presentations was this um, sort of commercial angle. So first of all, there's the idea that uh, the service initially is being uh, sort of aimed at presses and some presses may want to make all their data open and some may not because some of it might be commercially sensitive and they might want to use it for internal reasons. Um, and the other sort of commercial aspect, of course, is uh, I think, Lucy, you brought this up, that there may be commercial, well, there already are commercial competitors. I think, Christina, you mentioned this and that there may be more in the future. And obviously, Lucy, you were putting a uh, strong emphasis on open source and not only open source, but easily reusable because of good technical documentation to go with it. Um, so I suppose, do you, first of all, do you find it a challenge at all to balance the sort of commercial needs of individual presses who might be involved with what you want to do with the projects and with the data? And second, are you concerned about any kind of commercial competition or is that not something that worries you? And either one of you, whoever would like to tackle those. I wonder if the answer is going to be different. I'm happy to go first. Um, so from the data trust as a, as a industrial data space to, to use the alternative framing that is coming out of the EU as well. We just call it IDS, you get both. Um, one of the things that it's meant to do is to actually unlock not only public, but the private sharing of data. So built into this model is figuring out how to help commercial parties share their data for the public good and meeting their requirements. So from the data trust side, there's an expectation that we, we have a platform, uh, you know, this kind of data intermediary that can work equally well with all of these different types of parties, regardless of whether they are uh, not for profit or charity or public within a public institution or commercial, because all of them are generating very important usage data that has to be aggregated and looked at downstream. Um, that's not easy, but the fact that we know this is being done, you know, we've had healthcare examples. We know it can be done, um, but the one reason I think that for us, the data trust is so important is because that's complicated and hard and involves a whole lot of lawyers. And so <laughs> I don't think it's something that every single infrastructure has the capacity to go through, which is why we're looking at bringing this together as a shared data trust solution. I imagine Lucy's answer is very different. <laughs> no, I don't think it's so different. Different. Uh, I don't think that. So, so I think my goal with this project was always focused on thinking about how we can um, help presses that are often neglected or ignored or unable to participate fully in commercial spaces to um, to actually uh, compete. And how do we make sure that the presses that you know I think make um, scholarly communication really fantastic and the book space really interesting because it is diverse. How do we make sure that those presses have access to really good quality services and infrastructure that meet their needs and uh, which help them to, you know, continue doing what they do best? Um, and, yeah, I think if there are commercial players that are interested in providing better services to diverse small presses and to diverse types of players in research communication landscapes. I don't think that's something uh, that I would think is a bad idea. I think that's a great idea and probably, um, you know, something that, you know, it would be great. And I think uh, in general also, we probably, we definitely have a lot to uh, gain from an active, busy, 
coding community if we're developing code and there are others that are looking at it and re-implementing it and saying hey you know we think this would work better or you know we've made these updates as long as it's an open sharing uh, community and there's a lot of contribution going on and um, you know it's not just rent seeking and extraction of value without giving anything back I again I think that's we've got a lot to gain out of that kind of participation um, however in reality I think the work that we're doing is not particularly attractive to commercial partners. Um, we are really fortunate because the Mellon Foundation values diversity in scholarly communication and it's been willing to support what's essentially R&D work um, and community building work that we're doing. And I don't currently, I can't imagine it being a super attractive proposition for a commercial partner. Um, yeah, so I think we are fortunate in having a, a funder in this case. If I, if I could just add one other thing, I think that, you know, for both of our projects, one of the things we're doing is looking at how do we foster innovation in these spaces, but doing it in a way that's also helping us to protect the diversity of the scholarly record. Um, you know, one of the things for, for the data trust, if we can figure out how to make that, that process of aggregating usage data and navigating with all these partners through that data, like the data use agreement easier, that makes it easier for university presses to actually operationalize all of this data. And, and much like commercial parties are like, hey, we have a team, just give us an API. Well, can we make it simpler for those who don't have a team to be able to use this data in a similar way? And I think both of us are trying to do that with our respective pieces of that map of the stack. I keep I keep going back and forth of the technical stack. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, one thing that I see come up sometimes in conversations about uh, usage data is the idea of surveillance and tracking of readers. Um, so to what extent is privacy of that kind important to you and how are you trying to try to sort of embed it in what you're doing? So I guess I don't know. I'll, shall I go first, Christine, or do you want to? Uh, so, so in our case, we absolutely um, won't accept personally identifiable data, uh, and we've got very strict rules around what um, what partners can provide us with and what data we will accept from platforms because we don't want to be in possession of. The last three digits of IP addresses. We, um, you know, are very conscious of those concerns, and we have deliberately, um, yeah, set up our architecture so that we are compliant with GDPR um, and able to keep data secure when it needs to be. Um, and yeah, and I, I just think, yeah, it's an issue, and we are aware of it and I actually think for pragmatic reasons in terms of our ability to be able to develop this project and develop the tools that we're interested in developing we actually need partners to make sure they don't um, pass data that is identifiable to us uh, so that's our position I can share my screen really quick. I think a lot of it from the data trust side comes back to what the rules are for participation, which is, I mentioned we're working on a data rule book. And I think there, there are so many topics around privacy because there's some things you, you can do if you get the full IP address um, and there are some things you can't. But the question is with respect to privacy, you need to be able to have data provenance. You need to be able to control um, for where that data goes when it's sensitive. And I often like to say, you know, the challenge Open Data Commons is it's like having a horse once the horse is out of the barn, good luck getting it back. Well, if we share personally identifiably data, of data like the full IP address, if that goes out without restriction, how do you ensure that it's being used in a way that is tied to principles that is appropriate, that is ethical. And those are all things that we're gonna be working through with this data rule book here in the coming year. Um, what those data focused principles are around what's appropriate use, what processing has to be in place perhaps to mask for privacy um, and what are the data transfer agreements. And so having that conversation in community, like would it be acceptable for all if we just worked with IP addresses without those last three. Uh, maybe that is the case. And if so, that'd be wonderful, but that's a conversation we have to have. 
And then it's a matter of building the infrastructure to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, just to add, I'm continuing to ask questions, but people are very welcome to put their own in the chat. I don't want to sort of monopolize the conversation, but I do have plenty more. So if there are no questions in the chat, then uh, I'm keen to think in my own work and also I think it's relevant to this conversation about um, the issue of, of uh, usage data as a kind of proxy for something else like impact or quality or those kinds of different things. Um, and I think when you try to talk about usage data, there are loads of good reasons to talk about it um, with many different groups of people who are interested in open access books. And, you know, you might want to highlight the success of a particular book as a, as a publisher, for example. Um, but th there's always the sort of need to kind of to try and contextualize that and to try and make sure that people understand when you're talking about usage data, it's not a complete figure because as you were talking about, data is drawn from different places and plenty of data of, of usage of open access books is not tracked at all. And also to sort of try and say, this is interesting and useful in some ways, but please don't try and make it a marker for, for quality or for excellence. So those are sort of things that I struggle with when I'm dealing with usage data. Are those issues that you come across as well or that you're thinking about how to sort of manage in your work? I can talk. I can. I can talk about that a lot. Uh, the answer is yes. It is something that we run into a lot, and in part because, um, yeah, we're operating in a university. The other project that I'm involved in is the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative. I'm currently laughing as you say that, Lucy, because today. Uh, I woke up to uh, discover that a Murdoch Press publication, The Australian, which is, you know, quite popular among a certain kind of reader in Australia, um, had announced that that our open access book on open knowledge institutions was number six uh, most cited uh, books by an Australian researcher in 2022. And, you know, and I happily retweeted that with my tongue firmly in my cheek and a, a very strange sense of like oddness about amplifying uh, what I think is a very like really kind of meaningless number um, that was very strangely kind of derived. Uh, so yes, I think it is, it is an issue and it's an issue for us every day in the conversations that we're having internally with uh, senior leaders within our university. Uh, about how, for example, they handle um, workload allocation for research workload within the university or how they might handle promotions processes and expectations around promotions, the evaluation of universities. It's all absolutely huge. Um, and I think, yeah, I think it's really tough. I think for me, um, I'm kind of on a mission to educate people because I think the only defense against really um, poor uses of metrics um, is, is going to be increased literacy among the communities that those metrics are about and also um, the, the people that are using those metrics in an attempt to measure something. So I think, you know, with this project and the design of our dashboards, we're doing everything we can to try and encourage and implement and promote sensible uses of data to support conversations uh, about what happens when books are made open access and where they go and who reads them and to help presses to make good decisions about um, you know, how they distribute content. There's a lot of very valid things that um, usage analytics can help to support. Um, but yeah, but I would, yeah, I also think that as publishing communities, as scholarly communities, we also have little choice but to um, to really kind of gain an understanding of the data that is being used to tell stories about us. And I actually think it can be helpful to get involved in some of those conversations so that we can help to steer them, hopefully, in sensible directions. I'll just add to that. I think, you know, something else, and this is kind of for us where we, we bridge into impact data, is that it, it all comes back to context. And usage without context gets really challenging sometimes. And so in, in our conversations, we're doing the use case work uh, in the last grant, 
people kept coming back to, well, I want to know where it's being used. So we're in this world of linked data. Our, our book, is book usage tied to a classroom syllabus? Is book usage tied to um, political conversations or you know, a National Academies hearing? And that type of impact through uh, kind of the linked data component is something where, as we're talking about acting as a data intermediary, you know, we, we know we want to start with usage. It's an easier set of players, but there is this question of will it grow into impact so that we can tell a, a more complete story about that usage by providing context. And I think that's still an, an open question, but there's lots of complexity just figuring it out for usage. So we're starting with OA boot usage first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was interested that you described the groups that you're trying to engage um, with the dashboard as, as users. So you, you said you were going to start with presses, then move on to funders, and then also to include libraries and librarians. Um, how are you reaching out to those groups and how are you choosing who are going to be directly engaging with what you're doing? Uh, so, so Catherine Skinner's not on this call, right? So the the reality uh, for the first round, for this round, in terms of partners, uh, is that we are um, we're kind of engaging with partners that are are willing and keen and able to work with us at a relatively small scale. Uh, I think we're still um, sort of pushing towards selecting partners that are diverse and that test our systems and that help us to understand where the gaps in our systems are. So uh, so beginning to think about, well, what happens if we're working with um, a publisher that is publishing in a language other than English? How are we able, like, are we any good with a series? How do we handle these, you know, projects rather than just an individual press? Um, and we have a bunch of pragmatic things that we're trying to work through. So at this stage, we're engaging with presses, uh, but selectively. So we're not yet issuing open calls for uh, new presses that want to get on board with the dashboard service. Uh, but we are open to conversations. Um, and in this year, this first year in particular, we're still operating really as a research project that's heading towards uh, launching a service in the future. Um, and then separately from that, there will be a process of community engagement and consultation. Uh, we're still warming up to that. So we have our first advisory board meeting next week for the advisory board, and then we will be working with our advisory board to um, yeah, to make sure that our plans for how we're reaching out to different communities actually make sense and are consistent with the advice of what we hope is a reasonably <laughs> diverse, but also, you know, they're a, a fantastically experienced advisory board. So we're going to be leaning on them for advice and guidance a lot. And Christina, as you just shared in the chat, the OA Book Usage Data Trust has a call open for any individuals interested in serving on the board committees. Do you want to say any more about that? Um, I'd be happy to. And I know we were running out of time. So for those who like pictures, um, you know, so much of what we're trying to do with this kind of shared infrastructure is have community engagement. And so while we have our trustees and our project co-PIs, our project advisors, um, the work of the board really is, is so vital to our future in setting our strategic direction. So if anyone is on this call, has a passion for this, and would like to join any of our board committees, we do have one that's focused on policy and governance, one that's focused on board development to make sure we have diversity of voices at the table, um, and one that's focused on kind of our financial future, um, as well as this fiscal sponsorship, which is always the open question of, uh, as we are come out of this research and development phase and launch as a sustainable service, where should we do that? So if anyone's interested, please uh, fill in the form or just reach out by email and I can provide more info. Thanks. Thanks, Christina. Um, and as you said, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Um, I could easily keep talking to you both for another hour, but I will let you go. Um, thanks so much, uh, both of you, for for speaking to us and for um, giving us all of this information and, and the deep thinking that's been going on behind this project. Um, it's been really, really interesting. And thanks to everyone for attending. Um, the recording is going to be available soon, I hope, and we'll be sharing it via all of our usual channels, um, Twitter, email, 
the website, all these different places. Um, and there's also an event next week, uh, three o'clock GMT on Thursday. We'll be talking to Eric Hellman. He's discussing lessons from Project Gutenberg, OGOA. So he's gonna be talking about his work with Project Gutenberg and distributed proofreaders and how those experiences have informed his perspective um, on both the early days of open access and more recent developments in OA books. So that should be really interesting. I'm gonna drop the registration link in the chat. Um, but apart from that, thank you both again so much and have a, a good day, everybody, or a good evening, wherever you all are. Thank you so much for having us and for allowing us to geek out about OA book usage data for an hour. This is awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.